This is the President McCormack Podcast with your host, Mark McCormack. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today on the podcast, we have Bridger Battaglia. What's up, man? What's up, dude? Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, that's be fun. I like that we picked the, the girl room. We're in the ladies' room. Yeah. The fuzzy chairs <laughs> and the barn doors. Dude, the barn door is new. Yeah, well, is it? Yeah. Yeah, Dakota was just telling me about it. I was like, yeah, it makes it pretty in here. Yeah. You know, well, whatever. Set in the mood. I like it. <laughs> it's kind of a ladies' room designed by men. There you go. So I'm surprised there's not a doily in here or something. Yeah, exactly. He, something silly. Jimmy had his hand in it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, there you go. I think he does. He probably does. So, all right, so I've got a funny question to start off. Let's hear it. Ready for this? Sure. Would you rather fight 10 100-year-olds or 110-year-olds? Ooh. I think probably 10 100-year-olds or 110-year-olds. I don't know. I'd feel bad smashing a little kid, <laughs> but 100-year-olds were like, they grew up tough. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to fight either of them, but I guess if I had to, I'd probably just take the old guys because it'd be more of a fight. I'd feel better about it, I guess. Taking the old guys on? <laughs> yeah. I'd feel bad smacking little kids. So I saw that question on TikTok for the, like the first time, right? They actually said, you know, which one would you rather do for a million dollars, right? They okay. actually say the whole thing. And um, there's a guy that like pops on, you know, after the guy asks this question, he just goes, it ain't about the money. Line them damn kids up. <laughs> Dude, that's funny. Yeah. See, I'm like, I don't know. I feel like the old guys, would, it'd be more fun. Oh, I don't know. Dude. They would just break it to dust, I think. 100-year-olds, man. They're pretty pretty fragile. Yeah, I don't know. I work at the VA, man. Some of these guys are tough. Really? Still? Some of these guys are tough. Yeah. yeah. It's funny because they. I think in their mind, they're still 40. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So they'll, they'll kind of like get mouthy and start talking <laughs> about how tough they are. And you're like, dude, that's awesome. Yeah. I love it. So one fun thing about you that I relearn twice even though you told me the first time is you play football at the u yeah a while ago long time ago yeah yeah we're old now i know it's weird <laughs> so i was i was working with uh some of the athletes up there during fall camp last year talking to one of the guys and he's like so when did you play up here and i was like well 2008 was my first year he was five years old <laughs> and i was like when the hell did i get old man yeah. it was crazy yeah i was like this is not how it's supposed to go it was so funny I know it's wild. How old are you right now? Thirty-three, just barely. Thirty-three. I know you got these guys who are like fifty, sixties. We're calling each other older. Yeah, you know, flipping their lead. Yeah, no, it was <laughs> funny, man. It 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 hit. So you played this. So you were there with like Brian Johnson and mm -hmm. were yeah. you there with Paul? That was, was Paul our first. Yep. Or was he off? Okay, yep. Paul was and there. And Brad. Right? Okay, cool. Yeah, Brad was tight end up there. Nice, nice. How was you? How was the like the cohesiveness of your team? Dude, so it was funny. Um, I loved the group. Like it, it was a special group. And I think, um, you know, that's kind of why we were as good as we were. Yeah. Um, we just had a ton of buy-in that year and everybody was just down to do whatever. Yeah. Like there was, there was no holding back that year. And then we, we won a couple of like bigger games and we were like, holy moly, we might be able to do this. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you, you have guys like Paul, you have Brian Johnson as your quarterback. You know, like, we had some really good guys on that team. How many guys went to the NFL? Dude, I think we had, like, seven or eight drafted that year. Like, it was crazy. Yeah, it's a big deal. It was a good year. Who Was, was Star Lutulele on that team? So, Star came on uh, 2009, 2010, okay. I think. Yeah, yeah, he wasn't there the first year. But, dude, I remember Star coming in. Like, it was, like, a max day for the workouts. Yeah. So, everybody's, you know, getting juiced, and we've got, like, you know, big weights on the bar and whatever. <laughs> Somebody just finished max and everybody's going crazy. And Star, like this was his like first day. He just walks in, grabs the bar and just starts just running it out with somebody's max. And we're like, holy shit, this guy's an animal. <laughs> and then he does the same thing on squat, just grabs the bar, just up, down. Yeah. yeah. Like, wow, this guy's special, man. He was... Was he straight from high school or was he a transfer? He came from Snow. Came yeah, from so snow. he transferred up. He was yeah. a, a bounce back. And he ended up, where did he go in the draft? Do you remember? Carolina. No, but like first round, second round? Oh, first. Like way high, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was good. Yeah. He was way good. He's. Out, I'm assuming he's out of the league now, though, right? Do you even know? You know, he was playing for Buffalo for a couple of years. I'm not sure if he's oh, still playing, but wow. I think that's where he finished up. Yeah. I only know that because my dad's from Buffalo, so. Oh, is that his team? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I grew up a Bills fan, so when everybody was like, who's your football team? I'm like, the Bills, you know? <laughs> like, 
you know, being a, a guy in Utah, we don't have a football team. So I was like, okay, I got to go with Buffalo. And yeah. then you've got the Utah Jazz. And it's just like all of my teams were like so close, <laughs> but just couldn't, you know, cross the finish line. That yeah, couldn't make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, dude. It's uh, I, I joke around a lot about the Jazz being the worst girlfriend ever, right? Like, yeah. They break your heart every year. Then they you have a breakup over the summer. Then they... They get a little bit better. Yeah, and get back together. You get, you get your hopes up, and yeah, then they like, still break right. your heart. I mean, that's yeah, it's Buffalo, like four Super Bowls in a row that they yeah. lost. Yeah, yeah, they, they're looking pretty good right now, though. Yeah, Allen's you know? a beast. I'll tell you, last year it was it was crazy. I was going to win two of my fantasy leagues. I'm in three of them, right? Okay, and it was all coming down to that freaking game. But I needed Joe Burrow. Um, to get like, I don't know, 20 points. And he was averaging like 40, right? Then I had a guy on Buffalo, and I can't remember who it was. It might have been your running back. And all I needed was him to get like two carries. So he ends up getting like two carries. So I win one league, okay. right? And then I lose the other one because Joe Burrow only got like two points because <laughs> that was the game that that guy fell down. Dude, I Did you see honest, that? Uh-uh. I don't Bro, know. there's a guy that fell down like in the first quarter. Right? They're blaming on the COVID vaccine, Oh, right? you're talking about. They just uh, stopped the game. Yeah. Yeah. Who was that? Um, Demar Hamlin. I think. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, 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 something like that. And they just called it. We're like, so fantasy was kind of up in the air for a minute there, right? Yeah. It was like, are we going to play do we this do? game? Yeah. What are we doing this? And they just called it a. What's the? I think they called it a draw. Oh really? Yeah. And it had like massive playoff implications and all sorts of stuff. Like it was a big game. Yeah. I want to say it was like it must have been like the Monday night game. So. Yeah, I mean, wasn't there like ten million people watching or something like that? Like it was Probably. some crazy stat where yeah. he just dropped and they didn't know what to do. Yeah, oh, I think they thought he was dead and like all sorts of craziness. Yeah, wild. So, <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. So tell me, where'd you grow up? So I grew up uh, Sandy, so just kind of by the mouth of Little Cottonwood Canyon. Yeah, yeah, cool. What yeah. school? I went to Jordan. Nice, Beat Digger. Yeah, Beat Digger. For all the non-Utah uh, fans out here on the, of the podcast. Yeah. We were the, uh, Jordan the, High School is the Beat Diggers. Beat Diggers. Yeah, we got rated, I think, the second worst mascot in the country <laughs> behind the Dung Beetle. Where's that? I don't know. Some, like, Midwest place, but, yeah, somebody. I think that's what they were saying back when I was in high school, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so did you, get, did you go straight to the U from high school? Yeah. Nice. Yep. So we uh, we were all right. Like we should have been a lot better. We had a lot of guys that just couldn't stay out of trouble. And you on know. your high school team, yeah, yeah. So we we won some really big games, and I honestly think that's like the only reason I got really a lot of looks. Yeah, was um, you know there's some really good guys at Bingham, some really good guys at Alta, and um, playing against those guys kind of, I guess they were there to see them, and they saw yeah. me as well, and so it kind of helped out, but. Nice. Yeah, I played with a couple of those guys up at the U and just, yeah, worked out. So what's the, what would you say the difference is between the levels of play between high school and college? Like how big of a jump is that? It's huge. Yeah. It's huge. In fact, funny story for you. So my first day at the U, um, I I couldn't join up for summer ball because I, was, I thought I was going to be going to Brown. But because it was Ivy League and back then they couldn't, I think they couldn't offer athletic scholarships. I had to like qualify you for like an academic scholarship or something like that. Or maybe I just wasn't good enough to get an ac- like an athletic and so they're gonna try and get me an academic. I can't really remember what was going on, but the recruiter was telling me like, so I got like a 389 GPA and like 27 or something on the ACT. And yeah. I either needed like a 28 on the ACT or a 39 to like get the scholarship. And yeah. I was just like that 0.01 away. And so it ended up that I didn't go to Brown. So I had to join the U after fall camp. So walk in with Coach Witt. We're like talking. I'm like dressed up. I've got like church clothes on basically. And we're chatting. And he's like, okay, we finished up our talk. He's like, go down to the uh, the strength conditioning room. He's like, they're doing workouts. He's like, uh, ask for, I won't say his name. Ask for one of the coaches <laughs> and uh, tell them that you need your gear for the workout. And yeah. um just jump in on the workout. I'm like, all right. So I walk down. I find the coach. I'm like, hey, what's up? I'm Bridger. I'm joining the team. Um, coach Witt told me to come down and get the workout gear so I can jump in on the workout. He goes, if you're here for the free shit, why don't you just – just tears into me. <laughs> I'm like, who is this guy? He's this yeah. little guy, high-pitched voice. I'm like, who the hell? Like, what did I do? Like, I'm, So I'm just super uncomfortable. I'm like, whatever. 
So he's like, if you're working out, get in the workout. I'm like, I'm wearing wing tips, dress shoes. I'm like, okay. So I pull off the tie, throw it in the pocket, take off the shirt, and I'm wearing like slacks and yeah. dress shoes. It's leg day. So I'm like box squatting and I blow my ass <laughs> out in my pants. Perfect. <laughs> and so nobody told me um, like where to go next. So we like finished the workout and everybody's looking around because I know nobody on the team. Yeah. It was like, who the hell is this guy? Like, what's going on? Why is he wearing like church clothes working out? So I didn't know where I was going. Nobody talked to me because they're like, not sure what I'm doing there. <laughs> so we were supposed to go to meetings after, but I didn't know that. So I just went to the locker room and it was a Monday and we were supposed to be wearing shells. It's like a foam vest oh, okay. like underneath your jersey and yeah. shorts. But they didn't put shells in my locker. They didn't put shorts in my locker. So I go, I'm the only one suited up. So... I'm out there with 124 other players or whatever. I'm the only one wearing full pads. They put like these old, like back when we were a Nike school, like probably 10 years old <laughs> pants. So I'm wearing these like long, like cotton, not stretchy pants, yeah. full pads. And I'm at practice and I'm just like, I just wish I could disappear. You know what I mean? I'm just like, please let me just hide on the sidelines. <laughs> so we were doing, uh, we were doing punt or punt return. So they needed like somebody to jump out on punt at Killman. I'm like, all right. So I'm hiding in there. They go, new guy. I'm like, shit. <laughs> so I get out there and I'm lined up against Bryce McCain, who yeah. played for Houston. Was yeah, He was awesome. And whistle blows. And I go to do the same like stutter step swim move that I've always done in high school. It worked just fine. And I am upside down and on my ass before I can hear the end of the whistle, man. Like... <laughs> The speed is just crazy different. Yeah. And so, yeah, my introduction to college football was, like, brutal. Man, it was <laughs> out of the frying pan into the fire, and, like, it's a different world. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one thing, too, right, from the from the, from the college to the pros, right? Yeah. The speed's even, like, oh, on it's a different crazy. level. Like, everyone's fast. Well, Every especially now. Dude, you've got, like, DNs that are, like, 6'8", 270, running, like, a 4'4". Four, four. Yeah. Like, what the hell are you supposed to do against that? <laughs> that is a superhuman. You'll find a 400 pounder to block it. Yeah, no kidding. It's like, <laughs> what are you going to do? It's like me at 185 pounds. Like, it doesn't matter how fast, how mean. Yeah. Like, dude, it's a math problem at yeah. that point. It's like, you're going to get broken. Yeah. So, yeah, some of these guys are just crazy, but the speed's just nuts. What's the, um, what do you think, like, the big differences between like the player development too, right? Because in high school, there's pretty much no player development. None. And then when you get to college, it's actually very, very specific, right? So it's getting more so for sure. Like when I was playing, um, yeah, when I was playing, it was, it was there, um, but nothing like it is now. So when I was playing, it was, you know, um, you had like your weight goals and stuff. Like they wanted me to weigh like 240. They wanted me to come in and maybe play linebacker. Wow. And I was like, that's just never gonna happen. So I was eating a ton of food, you know, doing all the workouts and stuff. And I just couldn't put on the weight. Um, but like now, do they have so, they've got the craziest. So they've got these little sensors that they put in people's pads that tracks like your acceleration and stuff like that. And then it gives you like a score for like your recovery and all kinds of crazy stuff. So it's like way more quantified now as far as like recovery and like, you know, what, what are this guy's strengths? What's his acceleration? How are we going to like use this guy? And they've got like all this data behind it. Or back when I was playing, it was kind of just like, you know, you had like your position coaches and your strength conditioning coaches and stuff like that, but it wasn't anywhere near, yeah. like is scientific and data driven or data driven as it is now. Do you think that they really, that, that really helps player development now with all the data? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Like when I was playing, we'd have morning workouts, we'd have afternoon workouts. And then a bunch of us that were trying to throw on weight would get like a workout after practice where now it's like, they're only pushing these guys like heavy, like a few days a week because it's all about recovery and like everything's, super calculated so you're hitting like a percentage of your max lifts on certain days and like everything's just all about recovery making sure that guys are just dialed and like ready to go on game day yeah where it was a little bit more of like the old school just like push 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 and yeah. you know you'll <laughs> have to recover because if you don't you get hurt yeah but yeah i was way more way more dialed in now 
Did you ever watch uh, Hard Knocks? Yeah. Yeah. So you know all the behind the scenes crap there, and like, yeah, dude, it's funny, man, because you, <laughs> I feel like some teams like they are so advanced, you know, in what they do, and then other teams like in the dark ages, there yeah. Was, there was, I think it was the Browns, and they did the Browns. They had one of those coaches, right, that was just, like, making the guys do, like, the craziest shit, like, up-downs and, like. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I can't remember. I wish I could remember exactly everything. And he was huge, right? The dude was, like, 400 pounds, 5'5", five, five, right? And it's just kind of, like, I think the athletes have hit a different level. Yeah. You know, like, it's just, it's not that old school, knock them down, you know. Yeah. Just, what do they call that, roughneck football. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just different, man. The sport's evolving for sure. And like longevity is success. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's the thing is you got, especially with all the concussions and stuff like that. I mean, dude, I was a wedge buster. You know what I mean? Like yeah. terrible, terrible like strategy was put your head down and just dive into like 600 pounds of like pissed off Polynesian. <laughs> like not a great recipe for success. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But now they've got all these, you know, pads that they put over their helmets in practice to minimize concussion risk and, you know, super kind of like dialed in concussion protocols. And, but yeah, I mean, they're figuring out that, you know, if you can play longer, it's just, that's how you're going to win. Yeah. You know, you got a guy like Brady, who's obviously amazing mentally, but like physically, he's not really a specimen, but the fact that he was able to play as long as he did, yeah. let him develop as an athlete throughout his entire career. And that's why he was able to do as good as he did. Yeah. Is because he stayed healthy. I always tell people with Brady, you know, he's my favorite player by far. Totally. And um, actually, my next favorite player is freaking uh, Rob Gronkowski. Yeah. Like, I love Rob, yeah. Well, I just feel like he's more my personality, right? Like, if I actually ever made it to the NFL, like, that would be kind of my jam. It's here. I don't know. It's fine. I've been watching it. <laughs> um, but, I mean, Tom was amazing with, like, his calisthenics and just, like, the way he was able to, like, I, I tell people all the time, he would just stand in the pocket and get drilled. And deliver that ball. I mean, his accuracy is like unheard of. And then his knowledge of the game is yeah. like never be touched, I don't think. I just, did you ever watch Tom versus Time? You know, I think I did. Um, it was crazy. Dude. That's one where it kind of like went into like his new recovery protocol and like the TB12 yeah. method and all yeah. that, right? Kind yeah. of his personal life. Yeah. So the whole off season, he watches, mm -hmm. he watches film for like six hours a day. Yeah. I'm like, what are you finding? You know what I mean? The like, at that level, though, man, like it's <laughs> it's the tiniest things that make the difference, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because everybody's good, everybody's fast, everybody's strong, everybody's smart. Like that's the that was the thing is, you know, you're like all state or whatever in high school, and then you go to the next level, and everybody was all state. Like, yeah, nobody cares. Yeah, you know, and then they're all you, state there better than you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then you go to the NFL, and it's like everybody was like all conference, all American. And so, like, the, it's the tiniest things that you can do to set yourself apart. And yeah. dude, I love the picture of him on draft day. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. In like, his underwear? He's just sitting there in his boxers all, like, <laughs> slouched down. And you're just like, holy shit, that's going to be the greatest football player ever. You I know, know I mean? dude. I mean, but it's all, yeah, it was all his He approach. has the perfect story, too, right? I mean, he's picked, like, what, sixth or seventh to last? or 199th. 199th. 199th pick in the draft. And, man, he still has that chip. Oh, yeah. I... I don't know, man. I'm one of those guys that thinks that you can make it, you know, like eventually yeah. one day you can have enough money, you can relax. You know yeah. I mean? right? And with him, dude, it's like, I mean, the dude, what did he get? Nine Super Bowls at the end? Was it seven Super Bowls seven, and nine appearances or? Yeah. No, 10 appearances because he lost three. Lost the last one, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard when a guy has a 20-year career and he goes to the Super Bowl half the time, right? It was some crazy, I saw it like laid out. It was like won the Super Bowl or it was like, conference championships or something like that. But it was like his entire career, it was like one lost, one lost. Like it was just like. Just excellence. Crazy. So t tell me this, right? You mentioned this earlier. So in high school, you have dumb guys on your football team, right? Oh, you yeah. get to college, it's less of those, but you got a few. Yeah. Right? You just got some muscle out there, right? Totally. NFL, they're all smart. Like what What do you think the difference is in that? You know, because the stereotype with the football guys, right, is big dumb jock. And it's like, no, no, not the NFL level. Like no. most of these guys are actually very intelligent. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, I don't know. How are you quantifying intelligence? Right. You know what I mean? Like some of these guys, they're geniuses on a football field and you're like, please get somebody else to handle everything else in your life. <laughs> but they're super smart and they understand the game. Yeah. Right. And so you get guys like Eric Weddle, not the most physically gifted, right? Like average size, average speed, 
but he was so smart. Yeah. He was so smart. He understood the game, which allowed him to have the career that he had. What makes him smart? <laughs> For like the layman person out there that doesn't really get football. So it's kind of like you were just talking about with Brady. Like you put in the time to like understand the schemes yeah. so that when you're sitting across from an offense and they do something and they, they make a change, you know exactly what's going to happen before it happens and it allows you to put yourself in the right position. Yeah. And especially for a guy like Weddle, who wasn't like a physical specimen, you have to learn how to play smarter. You're just going to get beat up. And so seeing guys like that just become super successful because of like the intelligence and like the game smarts and like super high football IQ. Yeah. It's just, yeah. But like you said, there's also the guys that are just freak athletes and it's just like, <laughs> they've got enough gifts to just yeah. be out there and just, you know, make an impact. One thing that's fun, so I played center, right? And so, you know, we always did the calls, you know, I did all the line calls, mm -hmm. you know, and then you had the, the quarterbacks that do all the you know, audibles and, mm -hmm. and changing routes and all sorts of stuff on the fly. And like, when you really watch football, I think that's the difference between the casual fan and kind of like, you know, a, a more cerebral fan, right? Like yeah. you were watching formations, you were watching what they do. Like, it's kind of funny too, right? Like, so I coached my son's football team. There's been, I've kind of told the story a few times on here, but, um, well, it was maybe not in here actually, but we I was a defensive coordinator, right? And they were all 10, right? So yeah. we're talking little guys, right? And it was fun because we were able to be on the field for the first half of, half of the season, right? And I would just stand back there and just like the formation would, you know, pull up and I, I would stand right behind. I would stand right yeah. next to the safety. Right, here's right? where it's going. Yeah, and his name was Jack, right? I was like, Jack is going to the left. It's most likely going between those two holes. So start floating that way right now. So he'd start floating, right? And then the offensive line, I'd yell slant left or right or right, whatever, you know. Then I ended up, I mean, they're 10, right? So you do a lot of like all out blitzes. And uh, it, it, dude, it was like kind of playing like Madden. Yeah. You know, and then I'd like, I was kind of, now I'm big enough that I can kind of almost tap the middle linebacker, right? And still talk to the safety. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd be like, dude, okay, go over here, blah, 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 hit that gap, blah, blah. We, we were always sending linebackers and stuff like that. And we got really good. We won the championship. That's what actually. you were saying the other day. Yeah, yeah that you won. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that has more to do with the head coach and his offensive scheme, honestly. Well, I'm but sure I mean, our defense hurt. is pretty solid. Yeah. You know, like doesn't it was, hurt being able to call the plays out on defense. Yeah. Yeah, it helped. Dude, we were supposed to do it the whole season, but someone attacked a ref down in Lehigh last year. So like I mean, a coach? They, uh, I think it was a sideline coach, which dude, don't get me wrong, right? Like you have horrific calls. Yeah, they're, right. It's little league. They're or eighteen whatever. year olds making yeah. fifteen bucks an hour. No, to go bro, we have yeah. mostly like older guys. Really? Yeah, older guys, some women, some. Like, I mean, a few young guys, right? Yeah. Honestly, some of the worst refs were like sixties. Really? And it was like, dude. So, I think we had four <laughs> playoff games to win, right? And this is so funny because I wasn't that – I mean, I was into it. Like, when I was coaching, I was coaching hard, right? You yeah. know, the whole mentality, right? Yeah. But, like, it wasn't like during the week I was just, like, thinking of schemes or, like – Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, okay, it's game day. Time to put the coach hat on, you know? But we had we, – I think we had four playoff games up to the championship to, to win, and I think we came back from behind on three of them, including the championship game. Nice. Right? We won in the last minute. Very nice. Which is wild, right? That's fun. And it is. It's like kind of fun and exciting for the guys, you know, that kind of stuff. But one of the reasons why we were behind on one, they threw a forward pass. It was supposed to be a lateral, mm -hmm. right? Our guys did, right? The kid was like, the kid ran forward for one thing, right? He was on the line. Instead of running back, he ran forward. So then the guy th throws in the ball, the yell lateral, right? Even though we're like, like seven yards at this point, okay. right? like not a lateral. It like bounces in front of our guy, hits him in the legs, he tries to pick it up, but the corner had come up on him, right? Because he had gone down the field. And the corner ended up getting the ball and then running it in for a touchdown. And we're just like waiting. The whole team's waiting. And the one ref just calls it a touchdown. And it's like, no, no, no. That was a forward like, pass. Dude, that's a forward pass. It's not even close. So, you know, our head coach, most of the coaches were screaming at this dude, right? And it's like, and he just barreled down. He's like, no, I call it how I see it. It's like, do better. you know, so we've got like parents that are like bringing down their phones because they're like videotaping stuff right and they're like trying to show him he like won't have anything to do with it it's like dude at 10 years old you got to get these calls right yeah you know well, it's I mean? not it's not moving fast enough where you should miss it no no you no, know what no. I mean? like the game is but, so slow like if you miss a seven yard forward yeah. pass you're just not paying attention right and these guys do they get i mean they get screamed at right like they really do oh like, totally parents that are losing their shit there's freaking coaches that are losing their shit I took the role on, as I'm sure you could imagine, as fun coach, right? My yeah. whole thing was the the guys and the guys on our team were they were not overly um, 
intense. They really weren't. Okay. Right? They, they were they were actually probably a really good mix, right? Like, I mean, you want your head coach to, like, stand up for you, right? Like, he's got to chirp at the ref a little bit. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, there's yeah. – it's kind of part of the minutia of the game, right? And um, – but I was just like, you know what, my, the thing I can do the best is make sure that every one of these kids love their experience and have fun. Totally. Right. So I was in practice. I'm always messing with them, dude. Like there was one kid that, you know, like wouldn't explode off a line. So I'd get behind him. He was a lineman. Yeah. And as soon as they'd like say hi, I just freaking yeah. slam his ass forward. <laughs> <laughs> like right into the line. And then um, I always challenged him, you know, I'm like, if any of you guys can take me all, you know, buy you all pizza or something. Yeah. Good really luck. Know. And then just wreck him. You know what I mean? Totally. <laughs> just like sit on my knees and just boof, boof. That's so funny. But I coached football in, in, uh, when I was 29 on a ninth grade team. Okay. That was way fun. Oh, yeah. It was a little lighter than I am right now. So, like, dude, I'd play corner and freaking just intercept the ball over and over and over and over, you know, teach them how to jam with the line. That was a lot funner for me, though. I mean, 10 years old, right, like, you're, you're teaching a little bit of skill, but, you know, mostly it's just, like, get them in the right position. Yeah. And pray to God they'll get the tackle. <laughs> or there's not two boys – uh, block at them and it's all yeah, for exactly. right. just, you know, but then, you know, you got your, you got your safeties and corners afloat and, and these kids, man, they, they come to play. I mean, they're, they, oh, yeah. they hit pretty hard at 10. Like they're not, it's not, it's not, it's not light coaching. It's funny though. Cause like, there's a kid that cries every day. Yeah. Right. You know, and then whatever, you know, yeah. bangs her elbow, bangs her hand, yeah. bangs her head, bangs her bum, bangs her, you know what I mean? He did this to me. Oh, well, yeah. Like, then you you're know. mad and you, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> it's fun being around. So my son one time gets in the car we're driving home, and it's actually one of the best things ever, right? Because him and I just were able to talk every day. Totally, and like, yeah. You know, just and sometimes we took kids home, but you know, this night was just us, right? And he's like, "Damn, why do these kids cry all the time?" <laughs> I was like, "I don't know, buddy." I'm like, you know, they just get hurt, you know, like blah blah. He goes, "I never cry, dude." He goes, "This stuff hurts all the time. My fingers hurt all the time." So it's like kind of going down the list. Yeah. I'm like, "Yeah, man, you built different, I guess. I don't know, you know, good for you though." But like, don't don't judge them, you know, like they're young. Well, kids that's young. yeah. That's awesome that you can kind of have that conversation with him for sure. Because he's a stud. You know, he I remember is a asking stud, him, yeah. what, what position he plays, like D tackle. I'm like, man, you must be mean. You're skinny for a D tackle. <laughs> he's way skinny. Yeah. Dude, he, uh, so we played Copper Hills. So Copper Hills, um, then, you know, they're notorious for having a bunch of Polynesian kids yeah. out there, right? So their entire line's basically Polys, except for maybe one white kid, you know. And uh, so Nixon was going up again. So he weighed like 64 pounds. Oh right? So if, if you're 75 and under, you can Z down. Yeah. Right. So he's well under the, yeah. the range. Right. Um, the one kid he was going up against is 125 pounds. And the other kid was like 110. Jeez. Right. And I'm like, and you think that it's like, well, that's not that much weight, but yeah, it's like double his size. Like it really is. Right. And um, they were, they were wrecking the first quarter, but then they slowed down. Right. And they just got winded and yeah. that's what it was. They ended up beating them. You know what I mean? And then Nixon, I think he got two or three tackles that game too, which I don't if you you gotta know him better, right? He's so yellow personality. He's just like, hey, whatever, hey, yeah, this is cool. That. See that dad? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like one time we were we were playing basketball with Jimmer for debt one time, right? This okay. like explains my kid to the T, right? Nixon makes a shot, Jimmer turns around to give him a high five, and Nixon jumps up and gives him a high five. <laughs> it's just like you know, because most kids are just like trying to be cool and like yeah. high five, and he was just excited to be He's there like, with Jimmer. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, it just like bangs his head. Dude, that's like, awesome. Oh, freaking Nixon, you're the best. But yeah, man, I mean, coaching people ask me if I'm gonna coach this season, and I'm just kind of like, I don't know, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I wasn't planning on doing it last season, but my friend was the head coach, and he he just asked me if I would do it, and then I was like, oh, I'll think about it. And then the more I was just like, Yeah, of course. I'll yeah. Try and be there. Well, like you said, it gives you a cool opportunity to hang out with Nixon and yeah, you know. Lots yeah. of cool conversations that he'll look back on forever. Yeah. You coached? No. So um, I don't know, man. After I stopped playing, like I kind of became like a terrible fan. Like <laughs> I don't, I didn't like watching it. Yeah. You know, like if I wasn't on the field, I hated, like I always hated hearing people in the stands be like, oh, you saw, you know, Tom Brady's, you know, like what the hell you, I'm like, dude, you're in the stands <laughs> shut up you know what I mean? yeah and so like i always was like i'm never gonna be that guy like when i'm done playing i'm just kind of done like yeah. I, i'm just a terrible fan yeah so like i'd i'd go down after um you know when i was playing in college i'd go down to the high school and kind of like you know talk to the guys and kind of like help out at practice every once in a while like if i didn't have practice or whatever and kind of yeah. like i don't know offer pointers and stuff but yeah. i've never coached or like done anything official yeah yeah it's fun man when you get the opportunity it's funner with your own kid yeah it's also interesting too because you I, I didn't want to be the dad that was like 
pushing him into a position. Sure. Right. Totally. Of course, my son, he's, he's really small. And so I, last year was interesting because the, I think the kids had played two years before he had played, but mm -hmm. I thought he was too small to play. And I was just like, I don't want him to hate this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Or just get like destroyed, destroyed, destroyed. Like there was one little kid. I mean, he was little, dude. I bet he was freaking sub 50 pounds. Oh, geez. Right. And he ended up breaking his wrist and I think it was in a game or maybe, oh no, it was in practice. You know, he actually, they knocked him backwards and he put his hand backward and broke his wrist, right? He was yeah. just a little guy. And I just didn't want Nixon to go through that. But then at the same time, I was like, well, you also got to get in here because if you don't learn how to play this game, yeah. your skill level Jumping will late. be so far away from everybody else and you won't know what you're doing out there. Then you're like useless to the team yeah. basically, right? Yeah. And so I, I think I timed it right. You know, like he didn't know. I mean, he like doesn't watch football with me. You yeah. know, I've taken him down to Raiders games because mm -hmm. we have season tickets, right? That's why I bought the damn yeah, things. Yeah, that's wanna, what you were telling yeah, me. Yeah, take him to games and he's just like chomping candy down and just like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, he's just like, he doesn't even know like really all the rules. He does now, but like before last season, you know, he didn't really know him all that well. So, and I'm like, you know, I mean, listen, I'm a big dude, right? Like I had aspirations to go play in, you know, higher levels and stuff totally. when, I was, when I was a kid, but it didn't work out. But I... There's some level of your size that matters, right? Yeah. And to me, it's better that he just has fun and enjoys his life. I don't really care if he goes to college. I mean, if he ends up being big and athletic um, and he wants to work out hard and he really dedicates to it, I'll be his biggest fan. I'll be there for every step of the way, right? Totally. But, but if he doesn't have, you know, if he's not over six foot, it's like, I'm not even going to, like, talk to you about this because there's just, you're, you're going to suck, you know? Well, I mean, it just depends on what his expectations are, right? Like, if he's there and he's having fun and he loves playing and he loves the workouts and loves being, you know, part of yeah. the team and hanging out with the guys, I guess it doesn't really matter if he's great. But In high school, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just <clears> – when, when you start coaching, you'll see this. It's interesting, right? So a lot of these dads are like, oh, yeah, my kid, you know, blah, 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 this. And this kid, oh, that kid's amazing. Look at, this, look at his speed. And, you know, I'm just looking at these guys like – They're 10. Bro, we, yeah, we're 10. <laughs> we're on the B team. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you didn't make the A team because the A team's way bigger, right? I mean, yeah. you're talking kids that are well in the 100 pound range. Right? Oh, yeah. And probably six or seven inches taller than every one of these kids. Like, it's just. Dude, I remember playing Little League. We had um, two Polynesian twin kids, eight years old, like six foot, 300 pounds. Yeah. Two of them. Yeah. And we come out and we're like, what the hell am I supposed to do against this? <laughs> like, that is a full grown man. Spin. And I'm eight. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, coach. Uh, yeah. I'm going to lose this battle today. You yeah. know, like, it's just crazy. But yeah, like you said, I mean, the difference is substantial, especially at that age. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like 20 pounds when you only weigh 100. Um, that's a 20 <laughs> percent more. advantage. You know, yeah. like that's that's big. Well, I remember me in high school, right? I was like 265, 240. Probably 260, like six foot six when I was in high school, right? And it Jeez. was like, I was freaking destroying people. Yeah, I was going to say, what are you, what yeah. you going to do against that? Because I'd go up against 180, 190 pound linemen, defensive linemen. Yeah. Semi frequent. I mean, yeah. mostly, I mean, some guys would get up in the 200s, but I was super strong too and way aggressive. So it was like, even if you outweighed me, I was going to wreck you. But yeah. like, you know, there's just, but guys that were 70 pounds lighter than me, like it was just like, you're done, dude. Yeah. Yeah, especially because our offense is a double team offense, anyways, right? So we always shifted to whatever side we were going. Oh, it was okay. generally a double team on a D tackle. So playing center, I was normally helping. Yeah, right. Unless a blitz came, but then <laughs> but then I'm dealing with the dude that's like 165 pounds. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like oh, freaking. Yeah. It was fun, man. Our our high school team was really good. I went to Lone Peak. Okay, and so we uh, we did well, but did, until the playoffs, we lost in the first round. They're still pretty good, aren't they? Okay. Yeah, they're always good now. So they've got the. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know if they're open enrollment or what. I think everybody's open enrollment in Utah, isn't it? Like, oh. can't you go wherever you want now? I have no idea. Yeah, I think, I think that changed after I was there because, like, I know Bingham had that like booster guy that owned like thirty houses or something out in South Jordan, and he would just like, <laughs> "Hey, you and your family want to come live here and play football for Bingham?" And I know that that that's how they like got around it. Yeah, but I think now you can just go wherever you want. My dad's really good friend was uh, one of the coaches over at Bingham in the in the nineties, right? I think all the way through the early two thousands too, but definitely in the late nineties. Okay. And so when I was in ninth grade, I actually hated football in ninth grade. My coach was terrible to me. He thought I was I was kinda like getting used to my body. I was kinda going through my growth spurt, right? So he was like, I didn't get low enough. I didn't play hard enough for him. And I was like, Oh F this, I'm never playing again, right? 
Then the next season I go start as a sophomore, right? Like that was the contrast between him. He benched me the last two games. I was like, oh, screw football, you know? Yeah. But my my dad's friend was one of the coaches over at Bingham. He's like, oh, just come to Bingham. Like you can, go, you can drive to Bingham. Because I turned 16 in October. Yeah. So it was like, yeah, I could probably make this work, you know? And he's talking about how good the program was. But my dad's Scottish, right? I mean, he understands American football. But like the competitive competitiveness level to like get me to the next level like was never there with my parents yeah. it was all self-driven so looking back i mean if we were actually all about football like hey let's let's put some chips on this color you know oh yeah like he i probably would have ended up going to bingham mm -hmm. and so and they were a powerhouse back then and oh dude like, they were yeah state champ after state champ right in the 90s yeah and even into the 2000s i mean they were really good yeah they were really good it was funny so like growing up uh little league like i don't know we won two or three state championships and like it was always us and bingham yeah and bingham was always like what in the hell like they're just used to beating the shit out of everybody <laughs> and we were just this scrappy little ragtag group of kids that just didn't lose man. It was, yeah it was exactly just yeah. wouldn't die um so we played them and then my senior year we had like the 100 year anniversary game or whatever but our head coach was kind of an idiot and uh we didn't have a home field for my senior year because he like got the ball rolling for like this turf field but didn't have the money and so they like <laughs> bulldozed our old field and like tore it all out yeah and then we didn't have the money to like replace it oh, so God. we had like jordan's 100 year anniversary game or whatever at bingham playing bingham and we ended up beating them and everybody's like did not see that coming yeah but, like, we'd always have, like, big games like that in the middle of the season where we'd do well, and then in high school we'd just fall apart and really? playoffs and just, yeah, we just weren't good in the playoffs. Yeah. But, yeah, Bingham's awesome, man. Did you ever sniff the NFL? No. Yeah. No. Dude, I didn't have the durability. So I've had three, four shoulder surgeries, a bunch of concussions. Uh, I was, like, yeah, just not built for it. No, that's the thing. It's a big thing. Yeah. So there's – the NFL is really um, cognizant of how many injuries you've had coming in. Totally, dude. You're going to invest millions of dollars. Like, you want to know that that thing has a lot of mileage left. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you play, was it free safety or strong? Free. Free safety, yeah. yeah. So explain that position to the non So it fan. depends on the defense. But, like, basically, um, my job was to make sure, like, nothing got behind me. Like, your last line of defense. And so... Basically, you're just like watching the offensive lineman at the snap. If they stand up, it's a pass. If they shoot off, it's a run. Yeah. And like that's kind of like your first read. But yeah, biggest thing on safety is like you just don't get beat deep. Right. <laughs> that's that's pretty. Come much up it. and smash. Right? Yeah. Well, and that was the thing is like, so in high school I played kind of all over the place, um, depending on who we were playing against and like what their offense looked like. I mean, I'd play, I played defensive end when we were playing Hunter, who had a good tight end. I'd play. Um, free safety or strong safety kind of to the side of like their better receivers. If they had a good, you know, running back, I'd play linebacker. Yeah. So I kind of just played all over in high school. Um, but really like I was, I should have been more of a ball hawk, but I just loved hitting people. Yeah. And so like, I'd be the safety where I'm like sitting back and the ball's up and I can see, I'm like, okay, I could probably pick it, but I know if he touches it and I kill him, like he's not coming across the middle of the rest of the game. <laughs> and so yeah. like I'd give up picks and stuff like that to just blow people up across the middle. And I was just, I was mean, dude, I was nasty. And so that was like my style of play. And so it's just hard on your body. Yeah. And that's part of it too, right? I mean, that's like the mentality, like you gotta be nasty. Yeah. Our coaches, they actually stopped this our senior year. I think some of the parents got pissed, but they used to call us nasty bitches. <laughs> we call ourselves NBs. We actually even had a patch that we would wear. You know, and that was like our thing, like our sophomore year, right? And it's like, because you do, you have to, this is actually kind of a life lesson, which is kind of fun. It's one of those things you learn in football, oh, yeah. right? Like you have to show up. You have to show up with a freaking like, they should call it a chip on your shoulder. Like I call it like an attitude. Yeah. Right? So in our locker room, we used to like listen to like, you know, Metallica and like the screamy shit. And then by my junior year, I was like, which I actually like that music. It's fine, yeah. right? But my by my junior year, I was like, no, we're going to switch this up. Like, we need to not come out here like – like, angry football players are stupid football players. Yeah, right? you got to come out – yeah, you're emotional, right? you got to come out smooth, prepared, in flow, you know what I mean? Like, mentally ready to play this freaking game. So we switched it up to more like Notorious B.I.G. and kind of like the 
like a little more like let's put some swagger on this yeah we probably listen to a lot of like kanye and you know nowadays right yeah something like that right just like we wanted to walk out on that field you know like in sync ready to freaking go but like you know pumped up to where we're gonna perform but not to where it's like oh smash 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 smash. you know what i mean it's like the whole team needs to like work together and that's one of the things i love about football the best i think it's the greatest team sport totally like i really do because in the in the NBA on a basketball team, you can have one or two amazing dudes, and everyone else can just kind of be like, eh, right? In football, outside of maybe your wide receivers, like on offense, like you have to work as a team. Yeah. Every one of you. And if one of you guys is out of place, most likely that play is getting blown up. Totally. You know? Especially at a higher level, right? Because you oh, know yeah. the guys on the other side are gonna see that and exploit it. Yeah. And then, you know, and then the good thing with, like, you know, college and pros, like, if you're a lazy bro, like, you're not, you're taking plays off, like, they start noticing that, and then they start eating you guys alive. Well, and that, I mean, you asked earlier, right, like, what kind of made that Sugar Bowl team special? Like, dude, we just, there was none of that. Like, the the guys that were starting, like, the good guys, just, they set a standard, and it was just, like, it didn't matter if you were scout team, it didn't matter if you were starter, like, do your job or get out of the way. Yeah. Like, there, there was no, like, well, that's okay. You know, you, it was just do your job or get off the bus. Yeah. Because, like, we're going somewhere. Yeah. And like you said, man, it's it's uh, the ultimate team sport for sure. Now, that team was special, one of the things that, you know, we haven't touched on yet. So, you guys, did you go undefeated? Yeah. So, you went undefeated. You ended up ranked sixth or fifth? Second. Oh, did you play? What was Alabama ranked? Uh, are you talking about the end of the season? Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. Like going into the college playoff, I think we right? We were four, Would you like, five. I don't know. I can't remember where we were going there. in. But yeah, we we played. Because you played Alabama. Bama. It was like a one loss. So they weren't. Yeah, in they the lost to Florida. Or, yeah. And they were pissed that they were playing us. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, at the end of the year, Florida was number one because they won the national championship. Yeah. And then we were two. At the end of the year, right? Mm-hmm. After you beat Alabama. Yeah. I Which can't remember well what we were walking in there. I think you were fifth or sixth because wasn't in the top do they have the college playoff back then no no oh, there was okay. just maybe BCS you were fourth games. then you weren't in the championship game which mm-hmm. is unfortunate right yeah which happened to utah in 04 as well yeah right and so um anyhow but like the thing that was funny i love this dude i freaking love this i saw this meme right because people are like oh alabama's gonna kill utah oh, oh, Alabama, yeah. they should be in the national championship game blah 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 i mean it's the same shit every year right yeah and good for them right alabama's yeah. built They're a amazing. hell of a dynasty yeah saban's a genius yeah it's like all the props to them but being a Utah fan, it's like I'm so sick of hearing this shit. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's go. You know what I mean? Now here's the thing. I'll be honest. I had a lot of friends go to that game. I did not go because I did not think Utah was going to win. Yeah, I was just like shit. But we were having to fly into like Houston or like all over the place because all the flights were taken. Right, like it was a big deal to go to this yeah. game. Was it? It was in New Orleans, right? Yeah, yeah. So then I was just like, I looked at the travel and I was like, oh, it's like freaking nineteen hundred dollars for coach. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was like, screw it, we'll just throw a party, right? Which is stupid. I should have went. Right? I really should have. <laughs> I'm, I'm a pretty big Utah fan, right? And you know, and I might, dude, my family and friends. I have massive Utah friends, right? Like my cousin David, who's also a business partner of mine. I mean, he has. He's had his dad played at the U. Oh, cool. I mean, I think his grandfather played. No, he didn't. I don't think he played at the U, but he played for like Green Bay. I mean, like it's like a football family, yeah. right? And um, and that's through his dad's side, which is my non-blood side. But anyway, so we, <laughs> you know, I, I just remember seeing this meme that said. Um, the next time tradition scores a first, or the next time tradition scores a touchdown will be the first, right? Basically being like, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference what Alabama's done in the past. Yeah. Like, this game's live today. And you guys came out and smashed their ass like 21 to 0 in the first quarter, right? Yeah, I think we had like 21 points in the first seven minutes. Was it that fast? Oh, we were going crazy. Yeah. We were in my basement, dude. I was just going crazy. I was like, this is unbelievable. You know what I mean? Like, these guys are just smashing them in the mouth. I mean, you guys, was, it never got close, right? No, I mean, what was the final score? Like, 31-17, I think. Was it? Yeah. Something like that. Like, yeah, it, it never really got too close. But, dude, I mean, we just had so many good guys. Yeah. Like, I mean, Sly was amazing. You know, you got Kruger. You've got uh, Robert Johnson. You've got... Brian Johnson at quarterback. You got Matt Asiata and Darrell Mack. Yeah. Like, we had some, just some good guys. So what was that like? So you guys fly down there. How many days early were you there? Oh, three, four days early. Yeah. And you did you practice down there? Yeah. Walkthroughs or like actual hitting? 
mostly just walkthroughs. Like at that time, you're not trying to hurt anybody. You yeah, know? yeah. You're not going to really like. The coaches are trying to get you mentally, right? Is not the whole thing like mentally prepare you guys for this game? Yeah. I mean, really, it was. Uh, they tried to do it just like this is just another game, like just show up to your job kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Try not to get, you know, too caught up in all the bowl game stuff. But yeah, I mean, you're riding around <laughs> New Orleans on buses with a police escort. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's kind of hard to not get like. We had some media too, right? Oh, yeah. Did you participate in that? No. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't that good. Like <laughs> I was good enough to be there and, I'll you, stop. you know, whatever. Yeah. But like. You played the game at all? So. No, I didn't. And I'm bummed because of the concussions and stuff that I got. Yeah. So I could have opted out of my red shirt year. Um, cause that was my red shirt year. Yeah. And back then you couldn't play yeah. as soon as you played your red shirt year was over. Yeah. And so, because I was, I was pretty underdeveloped. Like I came out, um, basically like looking like I am now, like in high school. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, 187 pounds, I was fast, but I wasn't like crazy fast. Um, and you know, just adjusting to the speed of the game. So I redshirted my first year. I was doing pretty well. Um, they were talking to me about like opting out of my redshirt year to like play special teams and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just didn't because I wanted to save that year because I could see myself developing and I wanted to save it. And then I got concussions and didn't end up using all my years anyway. So, right. So, no, dude, I, yeah, I was there and helped and, you know, got some kind of cool awards and stuff like on the team for like, you know, most improved and a lot of stuff like that. Like I came in and I busted it. Yeah. But yeah, dude, no, media didn't even <laughs> know I existed, man. Hey, you never know. I never know what it's like. So, yeah. so the day of the game, I mean, what's the, what's the anxiety levels like for people? Um, I think that's just an individual thing. Yeah. Um, as far as a team, dude, it just felt like we were just like there to get shit done. Yeah. Like just dialed. So they prepped you well then. Oh Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the mental side of, of the game was where we excelled. Do you think anybody was nervous about playing Alabama? Maybe a little bit. Um, just because of, like, you know, you hear SEC. And yeah. dude, I remember, like, just in warm-ups and stuff, we're lined up against everybody. And there's a kid on their, like, scout kickoff team or something, like 6'5", got his... Jersey packed under his, you know, pad, just bricks for abs. Yeah. I'm just like, holy shit, this kid is on, like, their <laughs> scout team. Yeah. Like, just nuts. Oh, they're so deep. Like, dude, That's they're deep so team. deep. But I think, really, it was just one of those things, and obviously it, it played out that way, but it's like you line up our guys against their guys that year. Dude, we were just good. Yeah. We were just good. And we'd won a lot of tough games, and, like, we'd done a lot of, like, really hard stuff as a team that year. Yeah. So I think the belief was just there, and we just – we were just there to start smacking people in the mouth. It's funny. I mean, I think nowadays for me mentally, right? Like I would be able to be in that team and like, it would not bother. I mean, I'd be excited to play Alabama. Totally. I'd be like, let's go freaking kick the shit yeah. out of these guys. Right. I, but I actually think me at 18, 19, 20 would have been a little more like, Oh, we're good, yeah. but it's Alabama. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I just wasn't as mentally tough as I am now, you know, back then, of course. As yeah. Like well, years. yeah. I mean, the mental side of it. I mean, that's kind of like what I have decided that I'm going to like focus my practice on is just like yeah. the mental side of performance and i think it probably started from football yeah is just seeing like the guys with all the physical gifts and they weren't right with the six inches between their ears right and they just never <laughs> did anything right and then you've got the guys that are like yeah they're pretty good but like their head was always in the right spot and they just handled it yeah and i think that's where we were that year is we were just tough yeah. like the mental side of it dude we were just tough we were just ready so going and kind of pivoting back into your career, so you you're an MD, yeah, right. So you did. Where did you do medical school at? At the University of Utah. Oh, nice. Yeah, because that's yeah. kind of hard to get into, right? It's a good program. Yeah, I mean it is a good program. Yeah, yeah. and I think um, you know the fact that I was kind of like a non traditional applicant. You know, like I I played football and you know did business stuff and kind of I wasn't like the kid that was just like coming out of school and saying, hey, look at my grades, let me into med school. Yeah. You know, like I'd done some things that kind of made me stand out, and I think that helped. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was a good school, um, getting better and better. Honestly, I think you know the healthcare system up there's um, one of the better ones, um, and so I'm super grateful to have been able to go there. So, what was your undergraduate? So I did my undergrad in. So, so I started pre med because I was like, oh, I want to be a doctor. Yeah. 
And then I didn't know how to study. So I, I was always like just smart enough in high school. Like I said, I got really good grades and um, had some Ivy League like looks as far as like playing. And so I was always like smart enough, but I didn't know how to study. And so I get up to, to, to the University of Utah and I'm like taking pre-med biology and I'm putting in the exact same amount of time into studying that as I did in <laughs> high school, which was zero. Yeah. You know, I just like show up to class and pay attention and, you know, hope that I retained enough to crush it on the test, which just didn't work. <laughs> and so I got a C in biology and I look at my report card. I was like, holy shit, those exist. Like I've never seen a C yeah. before. You know what I mean? So I was like, well, if I'm going to have to focus on football or school, football yeah. all day. And so I switched to business. Um, did business for a while. And then when I got my last concussion and I stopped playing football, I was like, dude, I haven't gone to school and not played football since I was like nine years old. Right. So I was like, I was kind of just there to like, they all say like student athlete, right? Like student first athlete second. I'm like, yeah. we're all here to play football, <laughs> you know, like we're not here yeah. to get our sociology degree. Yeah. And so I just, uh, I stopped playing for a while kind of did the business stuff for a little bit and then uh, had kind of a cool experience where it was like, you know, you need to go back to med school. So I went back and got another degree in uh, exercise physiology. I guess they changed it like two months before um, I graduated to kinesiology. So like that's like the exercise sports science. They're like all kind of like equivalent. But my degree was in exercise physiology. And mostly because I was already studying all that stuff anyways for just my own personal benefit. And it covered a lot of the pre-med like prerequisites as far as like all the chemistries and physics and all that stuff. Yeah. So there was a ton of overlap. So I didn't have a lot of like extra classes that I had to take. So those were the two undergrad degrees. So once you, were you pretty excited to get into medical school? Yeah. Was it a hard path? Was like the MCATs hard or? Yeah. So I feel like I've always had like enough gifts to like do what I need to do, but I've never been like the guy who was just like born for it. Yeah. You know, like I was always smart enough, but like not as smart as the smart guys. And I was always like fast enough and like strong enough, but not, you know, like the guy. And so I, it always just took like a ton of work. But, um, you know, the, what led me to like going back, cause I was just going to do business stuff. I was like, yeah, being a doctor would be cool. But, um, I honestly just wanted to like take care of my, we were about to get married. So my fiance at the time, I was like, I just want to be able to like provide a cool life. And, you know, maybe the, the doctor route's not the thing. And, um, it, but I had like a pretty cool, like spiritual experience that like told me like, dude, this is what you need to do. And so I think honestly, because of that experience and like my belief that this is what I was supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. I didn't really care how hard it was. Like, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to do it. You know, like it doesn't matter what's in the way. Like that's, the end goal and I don't care what's between me and they're like, that's where I'm going. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was hard. I mean, I got, you know, smoked in a couple of classes. I had uh, shoulder surgery um, during one of the semesters. And I remember like sitting there, like trying to write lefty, like filling out like this biochem test or whatever. And I was like, I can't do it. So I literally had to take like a biochem test verbally with like the professor, <laughs> just like stuff like that, where I'm just like, uh, yeah. But you just figure it out. You know, the MCAT was tough. Um, you just, I don't know. I, I did well enough to get in, yeah. but yeah, it was not easy. Yeah. So where are you at in your career right now? So through med school, you do two years of preclinical. So it's all the classwork stuff. Is that right off the bat? Or did you do like, do you do like four years of like in classroom stuff? No. So it's two. Okay. Just two. Yep. So you do whatever, however long your undergrad takes. So for me, because I had to go back and do all the pre-med prerequisites, that was like two and a half years of just straight prereqs. So when you're smart and you plan ahead, which I didn't because I thought I was going to be a business guy and a football player, um, you like spread out all of your like hard classes. I was just taking like biology, chemistry, physics, like every semester and just like taking all this, the sequential classes. Yeah. So it was, I got wrecked, but you have so two and a half to four years or whatever of your undergrad, you start med school and most schools have two years of preclinical, which is like all of your super heavy, like knowledge base. 
So you get that. And then after two years, you take step one of your boards, um, which is like this nine hour test with you know hundreds of questions or whatever. And once you pass that, you're able to move on to your clinical rotations. And so third year you have internal medicine, which is just like your general hospital medicine, pediatrics, neurology, psychiatry, OBGYN, and surgery are like your, your core rotations. And those range anywhere from like a month and a half to three months. So you do those rotations and then you take step two of your boards, which is like the more clinically based exam. So that's a two day test or is that one still one day? I think maybe that one's still one day, but it's like nine hours, again, hundreds of questions. And it's more like clinically based rather than just like memorizing facts. It's more like, yeah, you have a patient that comes in. This is what they're presenting. What's the first thing you're going to do? And then your fourth year is more um, like advanced clinical rotations and more like specialty specific on what you're going to be going into. And so that one is... um, you know, a lot of electives basically. So like, you know, I was going to do plastic surgery. So I did a ton of plastics rotations and I did a lot of surgery rotations just so I could have more time in the OR. Um, but then I switched to psychiatry and so I had to like change my whole application basically like, um, you know, within the last year or so of med school before you apply and then you apply to residency through what's called the match. It's like this, it's pretty interesting algorithm, honestly. Um, I think they won like the Nobel Prize for it or something. Okay, cool. But it, so what it does is like I applied to, I don't know, 15 programs or whatever is included in like the flat fee. I was like, yeah, if I don't land in my first 15, like I did something wrong. Mm-hmm. So I applied to 15 schools and then I ranked those schools as far as, you know, if I get an interview, you know, liked them, didn't like them, whatever, I rank all the schools. And then the schools rank all of their applicants and then it just runs all the numbers. And if my top choice ranked me within their top 10 spots, if they've got 10 spots, then that's where I'm going. And so it kind of just like shuffles it all around. So like the whole medical education thing is pretty crazy process. And I had no idea, like I got into med school and I was like, sweet, I'm going to be a doctor. And then they started talking about like step one. And I'm like, what the hell is step one? Right. It's like, no, these, there's like all these, you know, big things that you need to do along the way. And I'd never had anybody like family members, nothing go into medicine. So I had no idea. I just showed up and I was like, sweet, I go to school. I, they'll get kicked out and they're going to let me be a doctor. <laughs> you know, I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you, uh, so how are you liking it now? So are you, cause you're, are you out of rotation or you're out of residency now? So right? I'm in my residency. Oh, you're so in it. Yep. Yeah. So I just basically finished up my second year of residency. So, um, out of four, four. Okay. Yep. And psychiatry is a little bit different because, um, it's a four year residency. So like internal medicine is like three mm-hmm. pediatrics is three emergency medicines, three. Um, and then some of like neurosurgery is like seven and not between seven and nine, depending on like how many, uh, like whether you get a PhD in the middle because you're doing so much research or whatever. So your residency kind of just depends. So psychiatry, at least at the U it's split differently at other programs, but the first year is, um, split six months on internal medicine and six months of psychiatry. So after your intern year, you take what's called step three, And that's when you're like a licensed physician. Mm -hmm. So you have to complete an intern year past step three of the boards before you get like your medical license and your DEA number and all that. Um, For me, the second year was all inpatient psychiatry. So either like severely mentally ill for, um, you know, psychiatric reasons or whatever, or inpatient medical patients with psychiatric concerns or addiction or um, like consult type stuff. Mm -hmm. And so depending on the rotation, I'd either be at the VA, at the mental hospital or at the main hospital and just focusing on like different areas of mental health to try and figure out kind of like what I want to do. Now, are you still technically in school? No. Well, so... Like you're not paying tuition or anything like that anymore, right? No, but like I think... um, 
technically we're still considered grad students, I think. I don't know. Somebody told me that, but no, we're getting paid. We're just getting paid like garbage. Right. Yeah. So yeah, working all the hours, making like none of the money. <laughs> but then when you, so when you graduate re- residency or mm-hmm. completed, I guess is yep. a better way to put it, right? Then you can go apply for jobs. Is that? Yeah. That so, works? so it depends on what you want to do. So for me, I think I'm going to end up starting my own thing. I just don't fit the hospital system well enough yeah. to think that that's a good long-term play. Um, but once you finish residency, you're eligible to sit for the board exam. Mm-hmm. And then once you pass the board exam, you're a board certified whatever, right? So like Howland, he did a, a plastic surgery residency, mm-hmm. was eligible to sit for the boards. Once he passed the board exam, he's a board certified plastic surgeon. Right. And so for me, I've got to pass my psychiatry board to be a board certified psychiatrist but right now, like I could, you know, have a medical whatever place if I'm just practicing general medicine. Right. You know, so um, definitely recommend people go to like board certified providers. Yeah. Um, you know, it's crazy, especially Utah where we've got like a ton of plastics. Like go to somebody who's a board certified specialist, <laughs> not like, a, hey, this guy, you know, did a general surgery residency and decided that he really liked cosmetic stuff and yeah. you know wants to give you a lip filler and a facelift it's just like yeah don't I do heard, that yeah i heard that from nick right yeah. like you don't actually have to be board certified to do no certain things right no and it's kind of like well i mean yeah you could be like a like a pediatrician right and actually do a nose job totally yeah yeah as fully as legal as people want to pay yeah as long as you can talk somebody <laughs> into it you shouldn't which is wild yeah, yeah like it's wild dude yeah it's crazy <laughs> oh dude this world man it's kind of funny out there it's funny how people market Right. Oh that's, yeah, that's where that, that conversation came from. Is I was talking about marketing and yeah, like how many plastic surgeons are there in Utah? I'm like I don't think there's that many. He's like, well, there's not that many actual board certified ones, but there's a ton that will do cosmetic surgery. Yeah, cosmetic yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, big big difference between yeah. board certified plastics and cosmetic. Yeah, you know. So with you going private, what does that mean? Oh man, I don't have that totally worked out yet. So private practice. I mean, it's just Howland's a good example, right? So he. He could have gotten hired on by like IHC Mm -hmm. or the University of Utah and worked within their like plastic surgery department, but he kind of like set up his own shop and, you know, practices how he wants and sees the patients that he wants to see. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking. So what I've decided that I'm going to like specialize in is like performance mental health. Mm -hmm. So I've been working with athletes and stuff. I love that, you know, got some business guys that are clients and like, we'll kind of, you know, chat through stuff with them. But like, I just love like the mental game. And I think it's kind of the steering wheel. You know what I mean? Like it was always interesting to me when I'd be on, you know, the medicine service or whatever, and you have a patient come in and, you know, they're trying to die and you're doing all this stuff and you, you, you know, you, you do all these things to the patient and they get better, but they don't really get better. They just get back to their like shitty baseline that they were at before they crashed and had to come to the hospital and then everybody's like, you know, high five and hey, we did a good job and, you know, saved the patient. And I'm like, they're going to be back in four to six months. Yeah. Like we didn't actually address the problem. We did a bunch of stuff and like stopped the acute catastrophe, which is good. I mean, it's better than letting them die. Right. But like, <laughs> it's just, it's such a weird cycle that I just don't love. Yeah. And that's kind of what our healthcare system is designed to do. Yeah. Is like, we are really, really, really good at not letting people die. We're really good at that. Yeah. But as far as making people like healthy and like super functional and like raising their baseline and like giving them like the tools that they need to like approach their potential, we don't even touch it. Well, one thing you and I were talking about is, you know, you tell people to get healthy. Yeah. You know, which is funny, right? Because, you know, in, in different, different aspects, right? Like I talk to people and I say, hey, listen, dude, people who are depressed live in the past, right? People who have anxiety live in the future. And we don't really talk about like being present and like the mental health that really comes around that, right? It's a lot of like, well, I feel depressed. Well, here's a pill. Yeah. I mean, well, I feel like I have a lot of anxiety. Well, here's a pill. Yeah. And those, I think, and this is just, you know, the gospel according to Mark McCormack, right? But like, I feel like we're going to pay, I actually think we're paying the price for it now. Yeah. But it's like not getting better either. Like we're getting way, way, way worse. I mean, you got kids who are like nine years old that are suicidal. Like yeah. when we were kids, that was unheard of. You know, and nowadays it's like, 
they make a big to do about it, right? And they get yeah. them into counseling and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, I don't think we're getting down to the core of the problem. No. Right? Like, what's the what's the actual mental side of this that's really, yeah, you know, I don't know, affecting society? But tell me, answer me this question: Is it? Do you think that's because of habits, the system, or like we don't have the studies to really understand mental health as well as we could? Like a little bit of everything, probably. Yeah, dude, it's so multifactorial. I mean, that's the thing is like, especially mental health. It's like chicken or the egg. You know what I mean? Some people, they've got a lot of reasons to have a lot of mental struggles. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like some of the people that I see in the hospital and like hear their story, I'm just like, holy shit, man. If I've been with through what you've been through, like I can't say that I'd be doing any better. Yeah. You know, like just terrible, terrible, terrible things that they've been through. And so they have all the reasons, right? But then you also see patients where they're actually like doing really well. And you hear their story and you're just like, holy moly, man, you've got just as many reasons as the next guy. And so you can't say that it's, you know, stuff that's happened to people because the same scenario happens to the, you know, two different people and they, they have drastically different responses. Yeah. You've got like the, the genetic and biological component, right? Where it's like some people are just predisposed to it. And then you've got the environmental side where, you know, maybe you're kind of like genetically lean in that way, mm -hmm. but you eat like shit, you sleep like shit, you're surrounded by terrible people, you're, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, that's just where you're going to go. Yeah. And so I think what we've done um, that's frustrating to me, and this isn't just mental health, right? It's just like our, our healthcare system in general, is we, we treat symptoms and we pretend like we're treating the actual problem. Right. And I liken it to like somebody driving a car and their check engine light comes on and they come to us and we put a smiley face sticker over the check engine light and we just send them back out driving. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? And it's like, well, you don't see the light anymore. It's like, yeah, but there's still an issue. And the problem is, is when the check engine light first comes on, maybe you just need to like change your oil, right? Maybe you need like a new $10 yeah. filter. But we put that sticker on there and we send them down driving and then all of a sudden their car blows up and they're stranded in the middle of nowhere. And they're like, hey, what the hell, man? Like, I came to talk to you about this. And we're like, oh, were you not? Did you run out of stickers? Yeah. It's like, no, that's not how it works, right? We're not like actually addressing the issue. And that was one of the things about why I chose psychiatry is I felt like the mental health side of things is so important and it's so overlooked. And so we're just like, oh, well, if, if they don't take their medications, it's just because we didn't give them the right medication. It's like, no, you have no idea what led them up to being in the hospital and you're expecting this pill to solve all their problems and it's just not going to happen. Yeah. But when you're on, in the hospital, you don't have time to like dive into it with patients and figure out like what makes them tick and what really yeah. brought them in there. Because you're pushing people through this. So totally. Right? You're cranking, man. And so it's like... <laughs> That's one thing that I really liked about psychiatry is like you have time with your patients. You know, you can really kind of like get into it and you can see, you know, what what actually brought them in there. So going through your medical school training and now residency, right, which I'm sure you're learning a lot, most yeah. of your residency, right? Yeah. What What's the biggest takeaways in mental health? Like what are the main top three things that people really need to do to like stay on a good path? Yeah. Um, like probably not going to like the answer, but it's the same as everything else. Like get your sleep dialed in, eat nutritious foods, stay hydrated, get sunlight, exercise, surround yourself with good people. You know, like we treat everything like a disease that has this like pill solution, but like we weren't designed to live life the way that we're living. Right. right. We're never getting sunlight. It's all this artificial stuff. You know what I mean? So we're never getting sunlight. The average person like, dude, I remember being in the hospital and like people are like, I can't tell you the last time I drank water, right? They just live off coffee and like Diet Coke. I'm just like, holy moly. Like, how are you going to do that? Like your body needs water to run. Like if you don't have water, you die. Yeah. But like you have these people that don't drink water and they feel like shit and they're just like, Oh, what's going on? I've got headaches. I need more Tylenol. I need a migraine cocktail. I need, you know, and I'm just like, drink water. Like that'll help, Yeah. you know? And then our food, you look at our food, man. It's not even food anymore. 
like the the ground is so depleted from nutrients because we've just overcropped the shit out of it so that it takes a ton more food than it used to to just get the same amount of nutrients and that's if you're trying but if you're just going fast food garbage like your body (laughs) doesn't know what to do with that yeah and so like it really is simple and i don't want to like over generalize but honestly like if you're doing all of those things you're going to avoid 99% of the garbage that most people are dying from in this country. Yeah. Like we, and you're, you know, you're making your liver and your kidneys, you're just dirtying them all the time, Yeah, you know? And then like, yeah, no wonder you, why you feel like yeah, you're clogging up all your filters. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're not, people don't think of it this way, but like what you put into your body is what your body has available to like build your body. Right. <laughs> like you're, you're giving it the construction materials and so people are eating garbage and they're like, I wonder why I feel like crap. I'm like, because your body's having to like resynthesize a liver yeah. out of like processed garbage foods and you're not giving it what it needs. And so you're just introducing all of these deficiencies that it just takes time of doing the right stuff over and over to kind of like plug those holes. Yeah. 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 hundred percent. And it's such a finicky thing, right? I mean, I look at mental health and, you know, not that I'm even close to a doctor, right? But I do feel like I understand people at some yeah, level, right? totally. And it's interesting, like negative self-talk, right? Isn't that, that's another massive one, I feel. Huge. You know, it's just like, guys, look at yourself and learn to love yourself. But that's such a simple concept to, like, say, right? So I think so people have a really hard time practicing that or implementing Totally. That. Well, and it goes back to that chicken or the egg thing. You know what I mean? Like... If you wake up tomorrow and you're feeling like shit, you're tired, you have no energy, you hate your job, your family situation's a mess, you got shit food in the the fridge, you know what I mean? Like you're you're set behind, right? Yeah. You're not you're not putting yourself in a position to succeed. And so that negative feeling of like, I just woke up like garbage, and then your surroundings are like reinforcing that. It's just this like perpetual loop that you get caught in of just like reinforcing the negative, you know? And so somebody comes to you and they're like, Mark, you just need to like have positive affirmations and start thinking positively. You're like, dude, get the hell out of here. Like you don't know (laughs) shit about anything. You know what I mean? Even if they're right, like your internal and external situations are reinforcing each other. Yeah. And so what's hard is you have to break one of those. You have to break one of those and it's easier to, break the external, right? And then let that reinforce the behavior that you're trying to have like internally. But it's so hard when you sit down with these people and you're talking to them and they're telling you about like how they're struggling and you're like, yeah, I get it. Like if my day looked like your day, I would be depressed as well. Right. (laughs) I would feel the exact same way. Yeah. But when you're in that internal state, it's so hard to get that motivation to like change the external until the internal gets so bad, right? It's like the whole carrot or the stick thing. Yeah. You either need a big enough carrot or a harsh enough stick right. to like change behavior. Yeah. And I think what I've seen most of the time is it's like that whole frog in a pot of boiling water is it's just such a progressive change and just so gradual that like it doesn't suck bad enough to really motivate behavior until they get to a place and they're like, holy shit, man, I got to make a change now. Yeah. And you're like, I agree. And this is years and years and years of, you know, suboptimal behavior. It's going to take some time, yeah. you know, like it isn't going to just change immediately Yeah. because the internal like chemistry and stuff like, dude, the, that's one thing that's super interesting to me is like how connected the mind and body are mm-hmm. and how you can change physiology with thoughts. And how much control, like if you have the right mindset, like the changes in your body and the opposite, like if you change your body, like how it changes your mental, you know what I mean? Like they've all kinds of cool studies where they're like testing blood levels for hormones and stuff like that. And the difference between like somebody slouching with like their chin down and like talking quietly and kind of whatever, like their chest up, you know, like chin up and like talking confidently, dude, like there's changes in the blood chemistry going on by just standing up and talking with like a bigger, more confident presence, yeah. you know? And so changes like that, super simple. And it's, it's funny. Cause like I'll, I'll sit with somebody and they'll be, you know, I'm super depressed and, you know, still having suicidal thoughts and this like that. And they're, they're down and they're low. 
And I'm like, what would you look like if you were happy? And they're like, give me this like little half ass smile. I'm like, not what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I'm like, give, tell me a time where you were just like crushing it. Like where you felt like you had a huge win. Like, tell me, tell me a time where, you know, you were just as happy as you can remember. And as they start telling me the story, their voice starts getting louder. You know what I mean? And they start sitting up a little bit more and they start getting more animated. And I'm like, see what you're doing right there. Yeah. You're reinforcing the chemistry that you want to experience by the action. They're like, oh, no shit. This guy might actually know what he's talking about a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like one of those things has to break first. And from what I've seen, I think the the external is easier to change and then the internal will follow. Yeah. But if you've got the the mental just determination and, you know, focus, I think you can change the internal and the external will follow as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you think, the, like now in your life, you know, you're 33, right? You've, you've gone through medical school, you've played football, you know, you've done some really cool stuff so far, right? You're married, married to a, yeah, you know, your best that's the life. coolest thing, yeah. man. You've met my wife the other night. She's, she's awesome. Yeah, she's really cool. What, what do you think, what's your best life advice to people? <sighs> you know, for me, man, like who you marry, I think is step one through a hundred on the path to success. Yeah. I think if, if that, if that first domino is wrong, it's really hard to live an awesome life. If you, if that relationship isn't where it needs to be. So decide who you're going to marry with who you want to become and the life you want to live in mind. That would be my first thing. Um, and obviously I'm only speaking from like my current level of ignorance. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> 10 years from now, I might have better advice, but um, another thing that I think is, is huge is if you hear that voice and I think everybody like knows what I mean by the voice, you yeah. know, like whether you think it's God or the Holy ghost or your conscience or your higher self or whatever, yeah. when you connect and you hear that voice, follow it. There's never been a time where I have heard the voice and followed it no matter how hard the path was and I've regretted it. And there's been plenty of times where I've heard the voice and I didn't follow it and I regretted it. Yeah. And then I think just try and add value, add value, man. Like it's not that hard. Try and leave everybody in every situation better than you found it. I like that dude. Add, adding value is, it's a very good way of putting it, right? Because people, <clears throat> I've gone through some things in my life, right? Where like in business, it's really easy, right? You want to make more money, you got to add more value. That's it. That's a very simple quantifiable thing. You know, if you're a, you're the top salesman for your company. You bring in X amount of dollars. You go ask for X amount of the net. And it's just a negotiation at that point, right? But that really flows into every aspect of life, like adding value, especially inside friendships. You know, because people think, well, I've been friends with this kid since, you know, junior high or high school, right? And like, eventually, if you guys don't both, or, you know, guys and girls, whoever, right? If you don't both pour into that relationship and keep, continually add value to it, and sometimes your value is just to be fun, right? Totally. Like when you're a friend, right? Yeah. Doesn't mean you know you're like giving them money. You're like you know those are actually the side things that are really bad for friendships. Yeah, you know, but like really like everything if you're with your wife, your kids, you always have to be adding value to that person, and then you become something who's valuable. And you know, and there's I think the people kick back on that and they go like, no, friends should just be friends. It's just no matter what happens, and it's like that's actually not true. Not even, yeah. not even close. No, you will blow that friendship up if you guys don't progress together. You know, or like that whole saying, right? Like, oh, you've changed. It's like I. Hope so. Yeah. Right? If I, I haven't, yeah. I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. You love the 15 year old version of me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I hate to break it to you. That dude was pretty yeah. preoccupied by himself and not, yeah. you know what I mean? Not the same dipshit I was in high school. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You know, you want to enlighten yourself all the time. And totally. The more enlightened you become and wise, the more value you can add to other people. Yeah. And I think it's that like reinforcing, you know what I mean? If you surround yourself with the right people yeah. who are constantly evolving as well, like you just, you can't help but just get better. You know, but you have to be somebody that can step into that circle and show like, hey, I need to be one of the people in yeah. your circle, yeah. right? Because people who are already doing well are very careful about who they let into their circle because they don't want anything screwing up what they've got going, right? You know, and so you need to be somebody who can come into that and be like, hey, no, like you're going to be better because I'm here and I'm going to be better because I'm around yeah. you and together, like we're going to accelerate that process of growth. And I would advise people protect that circle. Totally. Get people out of that circle that don't belong there. Like yeah. seriously, get them out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely.
Yeah. You only need, it's like what Joey, you know, Joey yeah. Diaz is, right? You, you only, only need three months. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you do. You could take you over a need? country. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so funny. I've seen that. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. He's right. Totally. You know, he really is, man. You just need your freaking good buddies. That's why the walk group is such an interesting thing, right? Because we have 50 dudes we can depend on. Yeah. Like, there's not a dude in our group that you couldn't be like, hey, man, I really need this from you. Yeah. They come and do it. Well, and that's been such a cool thing for me, right? Is like getting to know some of these guys and like they hear what I do and like they'll call me up and we'll have a, you know, hour conversation or whatever. And at the end, they're like, holy shit, you're actually pretty good. And I'm like, were you doing me a favor by calling me? <laughs> yeah, you know what's what I mean? going like, on here? Yeah. You know, but they, they're like, hey, when can we chat again? I'm like, dude, I, I'd love to. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you said, like there's so many good guys that like if you need help with something, call them up. Like everybody's been so cool and so willing to just open up and say, yeah. "Hey, yeah, no, I'm, I'm here. Consider me a resource." You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just it's it's a it's an interesting group, man. Yeah. And I think we've got something special for sure. Well, and see, your uh, disadvantage is not the right way to say it, right? But you have only been to one. I'm our, playing catch up. Yeah, you're yeah. playing catch up. The cool thing, though, dude, I feel like the group really jumped around you really fast. Yeah. Because yeah, wasn't there four new guys when you came in? It's like you, John, yeah. Wills. What other dude? Uh, so the problem is I can't remember who's new anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, just, I was just like, dude, I'm here to play all out. And I think everybody saw that and they're like, cool. Yeah. Part of the club. You no, know yeah, I mean? you just became one of the boys like day one, you know, like, let's just, let's just go. I think the group, I think the group either does that or expels you actually. Yeah. Because if you're a dude that's like not participating, like it's just, it just does not vibe in there. Well, totally. And it goes back to what I was just saying, right? Like you built something special. Yeah. Everybody's progressing. You don't want to throw a wrench in those gears. Yeah. Right? You're either adding to it and everybody's going to get better because of it or you're taking away. Yeah. And if you've got something special and you're taking away, dude, you're not going to let that shit happen. Yeah. And so by, like you just said, by building a strong culture, it's either going to chew you up or it's going to be the best thing that ever happened. Yeah. And both are good for the group. Yeah. You they know? both are good. You know, we've had some guys... And I say, unfortunately, for sure, you know, a couple of guys left the group and then a couple of guys have been kicked out of the group. And I think it's funny, the guys have been kicked out. Like we don't, I don't really judge them, you know? I mean, there's reasons, right? Yeah. But, you know, I've, I've seen a few of them and I'm just like, hey, you know, like I, I dab them up, you know, and I see them and just like, hey man, I hope life's good for you. I hope, you know, that was a good experience or whatever, right? Like, um, you know, one of the guys in our group just recently left. I don't, th I don't think you've ever met him, but he uh, he's gone through a divorce and so he didn't mm -hmm. re-up for the second year. And, and um, you know, I just reached out to him the other day, and I was just like, hey, dude, like, once you're in, you're in, man. You represent us, you know, so you're, we are the they brother. So, like, you know, what do you need? You know, can we visit you? You know, like, and you're going through a rough patch, and it doesn't really make sense for you to come back, you know, but, like, you know, still be good. Yeah. And I, you know, on that last call I did with the whole group, right, I said to everybody, it's like, guys, like, you're in now. Like, you're branded. You might as well get this thing tatted on you. Yeah. Right? Because this group matters, you know. What Jimmy does does matter in his personal life a little bit, right? Because he's kind of the leader. He's kind of the sure. symbol of the group. But really what we do really matters. Yeah. Because I don't want to be in five, ten years from now being like, oh, yeah, you know, a bunch of dudes from your group are shitheads and, you know, terrible in business, dishonest, you know, that yeah. kind of crap. Like, I'm going to be offended by that. Totally. And I think what our responsibility is is being, you know, like some of the first guys in it is setting that culture. Yeah. Right? Like, you, you can look at, uh, you know, Jimmy is like Saban. You know what I mean? He's right. the head coach. Yeah. He's, he like drew up the vision, you know what I mean? And he's got the right people on board to like make that vision happen. But like, dude, the locker room culture determines the success of the team. Yeah, You know what I mean? And so kind of like we were talking about earlier, right? Like if you're one of the guys that like people look to, don't play any bullshit. Yeah. If you see something happening, be like, hey, that's not what we do here. Yeah, That's not what we do. You can go do that shit somewhere else. Yeah. Here we have a higher standard. You know, and I think that's going to be, that's going to be cool as, as more and more people come into that and that's reinforced how much stronger that's going to be yeah. and, and how much more attractive it's going to be to the right people. And it's just going to naturally repel the wrong people. Yeah. And if we do it right, man, it's going to create a group of men that's thousands and thousands of bros deep. Powerful. You know, that have gone through things that, you know, this massive network. And when you gain that trust and respect with everybody right over years and years and years, I mean, 10 years from now, right, this could be thousands of people in this group are yeah, like going through the be. program. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, what do you guys need? You know, we need something, you know, it's like, Hey, I need everyone to, you know, share this post. You know what I mean? It gets yeah. shared 4,000 times. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's big. Totally. You know, that's a, that's a big, powerful, 
machine that we can build. And, and the cool thing is going to be built on like men that are being masculine and standing up in this world and being ethical and moral. Yeah. Like the backbone of the group is built on that stuff. You know, it's built on integrity, right? Integrity is a pretty broad word. It's also self-defined, which is kind of cool. You yeah. Know? Like it's cool that like our integrity is self-defined. It's not individually inside the group. It's self-defined. Yeah. Which I, if you really think about that, it's kind of odd, right? Because you look at a religion, right? And they tell you what the integrity yeah. levels are, right? These are the things that we believe that, you know, you have to do to be inside integrity. Inside our group, it's like, you know, self-imposed. Yeah. It's like, right? you know, right? Yeah. You know, it, when you're about to do something and that little voice inside your head goes, don't be a shit bag. Right. Like every time. <laughs> yeah. Every time. Yeah. And so what, the, what you're talking about, that integrity, that commitment to integrity is when that voice says, don't go, I'm not going. Yeah. When it says go, I'm going. If it says help somebody, I'm going to help somebody. If it says don't do that, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And that's the integrity that you're talking about is just being at peace with yourself. Yeah. No internal conflict because you're trying to juggle all this bullshit in your head of, yeah, well, I've got to say into the mirror 10 times every morning that I'm a good, powerful person, but then I go out and act like an asshole all day. Right. It just creates this internal conflict. Mm -hmm. But like you said, if you're living in integrity and you're just, you're reducing internal friction. And when you redu reduce that internal friction, you're so much more powerful because all that energy can be directed at accomplishing things that you want to accomplish rather than keeping all the plates spinning in your head where you're trying to like keep all these weird narratives running. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and there's a lot of freedom in that. Tons. You know, when you start when you start living that way, loving your wife, you know, showing up in this world as a good, masculine, strong man, dude. Like yeah. you, you get to be kind to people. You get to have good experiences. Like you get to have a good life. Life's just better. Everything up until that point, all the other bullshit's bullshit. You know, like one of the things I cannot stand is fake it till you make it. Yeah. To me, that's like the number one lie. You know, we say to be honest and then you then you fake it till you make it. It's like, no, make it. Yeah. Stop faking things. Just make it. Just Create make yourself. It. Yeah. yeah. Be, be the guy. As long as you're trying, you're making it. Yep. You know, even if you don't know everything. I mean, I get the principle behind fake it till you make yeah. it. Yeah. But it's just a lie. Yeah. So. Yeah. And if you're coming at it from that place of you know you're faking it, nobody's going to feel you being a genuine person. Well, and that's, I think, the problem with fake it till you make it is you know. Yeah, that's what you I'm saying. You know what's a lie. Is if you know you're full of shit, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter how well you've practiced the story. Yeah. Right? People with a high enough, like, EQ, right? You know, like, guys like you and I, we can sit across from somebody and be like, this guy doesn't believe what he's saying. Right. <laughs> right? He might have all the highs and the lows and, yeah. the, you know, the dramatic effect and, you know, he's a great speaker. But like you and I can be like, mm, he doesn't believe what he's saying. Yeah. See, and I think imposter syndrome comes directly from fake it till you make it. Because some guys kind of faked it and got into something and it kind of got big and they're just like, I don't really know if I belong here. Because when you grind to something and make it work, or even if you don't have to grind, even if you just come up with a really good strategy and execute it perfectly, you don't freaking feel like an imposter when you hit the when you hit those levels. You just don't. Yeah, you're not surprised because you know you're going to deliver. Yeah. But I think what what the imposter syndrome is, is it's trying to pretend like you're, you know, three steps ahead of where you actually are. Yeah. Or you're buying a Rolex and yeah. praying to God you can pay your mortgage Yeah, holy shit, month. please let somebody <laughs> like my Instagram post with my Rolex yeah, and yeah. my rented Lambo so yeah. that I can get some traction and be a coach. You know, it's like, right. oh shit, yeah. Coaching, man, that, that is a slippery slope. Dude. That is a slippery freaking slope. And I think that's, it's kind of funny because like, being a psychiatrist, right? Like people think I'm like a therapist and then they're like, well, I'm like, I hate the term life coach. Yeah. I hate it because every shithead 23 year old that goes out and does <laughs> summer sales and makes 30 grand and buys himself a Mazda three is now a life coach. Yeah. Yeah. But I also like the idea of coaching because like, I've always like had this thing where like doctors are there to teach people. Like that's your job. Like, in fact, I think that's where the word doctor comes from in Latin is like to teach. Yeah. And so like, I see myself as somebody who's like trying to educate people on how they can improve their lives. But I'm also fiery, right? Coaches can yell and teachers can't. Yeah. And so I like the idea of coaching where it's like, look, you came to me. I'm telling you, this is the weight you got to lift. Yeah. These are the sprints you got to run. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. You came to me. Yeah. You're the one struggling. Yeah. I don't give a shit. I don't get better <laughs> if you take your meds. I don't get better if you go to the gym. I don't get better if you start taking care of your relationships. Does not matter to me. You came to me. Yeah. And so I like being able to have that attitude with the people that I'm working with of like, look, 
I'm here to tell you what I think will help you. I've got a track record that shows at least enough for you to come to me and ask for my help. Yeah. But I don't know what to call myself, right? <laughs> it's like, am I a coach? It's kind of, am I a consultant in a lot of circumstances? Yeah. Am I a doctor? Yes. Am, you know what I mean? So it's like, I don't go shaman. Yeah. Shaman. There you go. <laughs> life shaman. Let's dude, come up with a new category. Life shaman. You and me, dude, let's take over the life shaman space. <laughs> let's create it. I love it. Oh yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah. Let's go. Well, my friend, dude, we're, we're at an hour and a half. Can you believe that? No, that flew. It goes by fast. So I always ask everybody at the end, what's your best two minutes of advice? You know, I kind of already gave my nuggets, you know, earlier of just like marry the right person, you know, listen to the voice, yeah, add value. Um, there's got to be another one in there. I think like play your game. Don't don't get caught up in trying to live somebody else's life. Decide what's going to make you happy. Decide what success looks like for you and like forget what anybody else says about it and just get there. Because I, I'll never be as cool as you are if I'm trying to be the next Mark McCormack. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. You know what I mean? If I see how you're showing up and like, oh, people really like Mark. I got to act more like Mark. Um, it goes back to that imposter syndrome, right? Like exactly. I know, like I'm never going to be able to show up like you do if I'm trying to show up like you do. Yeah. But if I'm just like, why do people like me? What do I add? You know, how do I add value? What, what, what value do I bring? And I just try and double down on that. And I just like try and figure out who I am and yeah. just be the best version of myself that I can be. I feel like that's a way better like recipe for success. I agree 100%. I've said a lot of times to people, it's like, dude, I want to see the most authentic version of you with the shit. Yeah. Right? Because then it's it, it's honest and it, it's yeah. so much easier to connect when you do that, right? It's exactly what you're saying. Like you don't, if you want to be more, if you see someone that's charismatic and you think, oh, I could be more charismatic if I chose to be, then choose to be a little bit more charismatic. Yeah. But don't choose to be that person. Yeah. You know, like, like Dave Chappelle is hilarious, right? My favorite comedian of all time is not even close, right? I love his humor. I oh, would he's never- a would not, I would never try and recreate it though. Cause I am not him. Yeah. There's not a chance. It would come across so stupid. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if I want to be funny, I gotta be funny in my way. And then once you, once you realize that identity, you, yeah, you just, you and just then people gravitate it. to you. Yeah. You're like, yeah, I'm just me. And then you like, you look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I'm awesome. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. all of a sudden you're doing good. And like you said, the, the right people gravitate towards you, right? Yeah. The people that are going to be around that and are attracted to that. It's cool because then you have people that like you for you. Yeah. But if you've built this whole circle of people that like you, because I'm trying to be like Mark, it's exhausting. Yeah. And you you can never take that mask off because you're like, oh shit, if they actually found out who I really am, they're all going to run away. <laughs> right. You know, but which if you is just, probably not true, but yeah. Yeah, but if or you, maybe it is. I yeah. don't know, but if you build that circle on like this is who I am, you know, love it or leave it. Some will, some won't. So yeah. what? You just go for it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, my friend, thanks for coming on the podcast, dude. This was fun. I'm excited for the guys to hear about you. Yeah, this was fun. So, all right, until next time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the President McCormack Podcast, brought to you by McCormack Foundation, Saxton Fund, ADP Lemco, and Professional Floor Systems. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and keep up with Mark on Instagram at President McCormack.